Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan Moon, the Public Policy Manager here at the Greater Des Moines Partnership, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the partnership and collaboration with Capital Crossroads, the Young Professionals Connection, welcome you to today's conversation about inclusive economic development. For attendees, we ask you to place any questions you have uh, in the chat to be moderated near the end of the programming. We would like to take a moment and remind everyone the importance of civility. The partnership supports the Drake University's Race Center Show Some Respect campaign. And with that, I would like to take a moment to remind everyone of the importance of civility in today's event. Advancing meaningful conversation requires respect. At the partnership, we urge all Iowans to be courteous as they express their opinions about issues. Together, we can have tough conversations in a respectful way and find a common ground solution. As an organization, the goal is to educate a broad audience on policy topics so more people can understand the issues and advocate for our public officials. And that's why we decided to host public policy issue forums this year. For 2021, we scheduled six issue forums that have taken place every other month on the third Tuesday at noon, except this month because next Tuesday, well, it gets a little bit closer to Christmas. So thank you guys for, for joining us here. Uh, we've covered a variety of topics from childcare, broadband, community placemaking, affordable housing, and justice reform. If you would like to watch any of the previous forums, please reach out to me and I will give you that recording. Our final forum today will cover inclusive economic development. Key to the mission of the partnership, economic development is essential to the growth of Iowa's population and economy. With a footprint representing both urban and rural Iowa, the partnership supports efforts that assist in the recruitment and retention of business and talent throughout the state. The partner supports legislation that demonstrates that Iowa welcomes all people and is open for business. Growing and vibrant communities are necessary to support our diverse talent and workforce needs. We understand that today's topic is very broad, but we decided to focus on these key areas today, transit, childcare, and disability policies. But I'm sure that today's conversation will expand into future policy issue forums in 2022 and beyond. I'll now turn it over to our experts to better dive into the issues by introducing our moderator, Abby Gilroy. Abby has been in real estate development for 15 years with an early focus on regionally based retail development. Her sites changed to a more local emphasis when she joined Neighborhood Development Corporation in 2011. In her current role as executive director, she engages with community stakeholders and elected officials to identify areas of redevelopment opportunity in Des Moines neighborhood. Through public and private partnerships, Neighborhood Development Corporation has brought vitality and revitalization into neighborhoods that have been otherwise overlooked. Abby was born and raised in Des Moines and has a degree from Iowa State University. Abby, the floor is yours. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction and for putting this on. I'm um, genuinely excited and really appreciative of being um, asked to be involved with this today. So thank you for that. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. We'll start there, um, starting with Luis Montoya. He is the chief planning officer for DART. Luis joined DART in 2018 and has since uh, led the planning and implementation of two major service changes, as well as DART's first mobility on demand pilot. Before joining DART, Montoya was the director of livable streets for San Francisco's Municipal Transportation Agency. He holds a master's degree in city planning from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Also with us is Don Oliver Wand, president and CEO of Iowa's Women's or Iowa Women's Foundation, excuse me, originally from Des Moines and a graduate of University of Iowa. She returned to Iowa City after 30 years in Kansas City. She joined the Iowa Women's Foundation as executive director in February 2013 after serving as executive director for the Women's Foundation of Greater Kansas City. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in social work and has worked in the nonprofit field for more than 34 years as a volunteer and a professional. 
She spent the first 15 years in the public housing field, providing direct services, and then moved into nonprofit management, focusing on fundraising and ultimately providing vision, leadership, and management to two women's funds. In 2013, the Corridor Business Journal named Dawn as one of the area's movers and shakers. She was recognized by Her Magazine, a publication of the Gazette, as a 2018 Her Women of Achievement Award honoree. Also with us is Daniel Van Sant, the Director of Disability Policy for the Harkin Institute at Drake University. Daniel is a disability rights attorney who has practiced most extensively in the areas of inclusive, inclusive education, gender-based violence, and inclusive international development. He draws on his personal and professional experience with disability in leading the disability policy work at the Harkin Institute. Prior to joining the Harkin Institute, Daniel was staff attorney at Disability Rights Iowa, where he provided free legal representation to children with disabilities and their families defending their rights under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and other state and federal disability laws. He also monitored institutions and facilities around Iowa that house youth with disabilities and provided consultation on emergence, emerging special education issues to state and local stakeholders. Prior to his work at Disability Rights Iowa, Daniel represented survivors of sexual assault in a variety of civil legal matters as a staff attorney with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. In addition to his direct representation legal work, Daniel has worked in disability law and policy at the national and international levels through several fellowships, grants, and con oh, excuse me, <laughs> fellowships and grants, excuse me. Daniel received bachelor degree in international relations, rhetoric and politics from Drake University. He earned his Juris Doctorate and a Master's of Science in Cultural Foundations of Education with a Certificate of Advanced Studies and Disability Studies from Syracuse University. When he is not working, Daniel enjoys traveling, learning languages, and tending to his ex excessive, <laughs> excessive number of houseplants. I love that, that's so funny. All right, so thank you panelists for joining us, uh, making time for this today. We know everybody's schedules are busy, so we're thrilled you're here. Um, I'd like to give you each a moment to, to say hello to the crowd, um, elaborate on yourselves a little bit if you'd like to, and then um, close that up with answering the question of what does inclusive economic development mean to you? So we will start with Luis. Thank you, Abby. And I'm um, really grateful to be on the panel today and look forward to uh, this discussion. And really, we, we started chatting even before the, the formal meeting started and I'm already just excited to hear what, um, what some of the others, you know, have to say. And so it's a really, um, it's an exciting time, I think, for us to be talking about this, as I'm sure we'll get into the moment that we're in now and, and kind of what the, what the needs of our region are. But um, taking a step back as the chief planning officer here at DART, um, my role is to, is to think about our, our routes um, and, and our schedules and our service overall and, and how we serve the community. And so we really think of our services as a, as a, um, as access to opportunity um, and public transit, you know, by its design is really meant to be inclusive. There are some, some federal requirements, you know, like, um, you know, ADA requirements, but there's also our desire to serve our community and in particular um, work with many of the partners that we work with to understand the needs of, of different populations. And so, you know, some examples of that are that, you know, our vehicles are, are fully ADA accessible, all of them um, are, our fair payment is, um, is, is affordable, but we also have options for even reduced fair payments for those who you know, fall into, into certain categories. Um, we also have, you know, we think about language inclusivity in, in you know, trying to use you know, pictographs to, to help people understand you know, how, to, um, how to use our services, but then also having translation services available. Um, we also think a lot about, about where we serve in our community and how do we expand opportunity by serving more places. And um, that's a piece that, that, that I you know, probably work the most directly on and, and we're in the, in the midst of a long range plan right now where we are trying to add uh, more flexibility into, into how we serve our community because that's one of the things that we've heard is that people as they're moving about really desire to, to have more flexibility. Um, no, matter, no matter what you know, kind of your background is, what um, you know, your, your walk of life, ability, um, stage of life, really what people are looking for is, is, is some flexibility to get where they, need to, where they need to go when they need to get there. 
And so, um, so we've been thinking a lot about where we serve, the times of day we serve, and then, um, as I mentioned, you know, some of the some of the vehicles and fare types. Um, maybe I'll leave it there as a, as an introduction for now, um, and I'm sure we'll have we'll have more to go on it. All right, thank you so much for that. Sorry, I just make a couple notes. Um, all of, or let's see, Don. If you would like to answer that same question, um, what does inclusive economic development mean to you? Sure, thank you, Abby, and um, mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. I'm honored to be here today with my fellow panelists to have this conversation. Um, as you all heard, I represent the Iowa Women's Foundation. Um, women are half the population, half the workforce, and really do play an important role in um, economic development. At the Women's Foundation, we work to improve the lives of Iowa's women and girls through economic self-sufficiency. We believe if women are successful, their families will be and ultimately their communities will be. We work through research, grant making, advocacy, education and training and collaboration to break down those barriers that are keeping women from being successful. Through our community conversations, we learned that childcare is the number one barrier to economic success right now for women in our community. If women don't have childcare, they can't go to work. They can't get the education they need and they also cannot um, take advantage of trainings and advancements and things like that for themselves. The pandemic shined a light on how important child care is, it showed that it really is an economic issue, a family issue, a workforce issue. So we are now working all across the state with many, many community partners to increase the availability so we can see economic development and economic recovery for our families, our businesses, and our communities all across the state. I'm excited to hear what my panelists have to say, and I'm excited to share more with you about the work we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Don. All right, Daniel, you're up. What does inclusive economic development mean to you? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm also excited to be here on this panel and, and learn from the other panelists. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. I'll talk a little bit about what we do here at the Harkin Institute and then answer the question. Um, as best I can, because I think it's obviously a pretty complex question <laughs> for us to grapple with. Um, so the Harkin Institute at Drake University, um, our, our slogan is connecting people with policy. And so what we strive to do is to be that liaison between policymakers and people that it affects and, and vice versa. Um, we do work in a few different public policy areas. I am our director of disability policy but we also work in retirement security, wellness and nutrition, and labor and employment as well. Um, all of those issues intersect with disability, um, but I'm gonna focus on some of our disability policy work today. A lot of our work is focused on disability inclusive employment, um, which I can talk about, I think a little bit later in the agenda, but it's, it's really working from both directions, helping people with disabilities find um, inclusive employment, integrated competitive employment, as well as helping businesses fill those employment needs, right? So we'll have a number of companies and businesses come to us and ask just, how do we do this? How do we hire people? How do we recruit them, retain them, and provide accessible, accommodating workspaces? So that's um, one branch of our work. And we, we showcase that annually at a International Disability Employment Summit. Um, and this year we will be having it in Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, June 7th and 8th. And we, we hope that people from Des Moines and people from Iowa are able to join us in that global discussion as well. But we, we do a lot of work here in Iowa. We had an Iowa-based summit last, um, last fall or over the summer, I should say, that focused on on just today's topic, inclusive economic development and employment in Iowa. Uh, we do a little bit of work on accessible design and universal design as well, um, and a variety of other issues related to disability. In terms of what does inclusive economic development mean to me um, under the disability lens, I guess what I would want people to take away from, from my comments today 
is that I want people to think of disability at all levels of development and economic engagement, right? I think we tend to think of people with disabilities as maybe being consumers or on the on one end of the spectrum, but people with disabilities are small business owners, right? They're entrepreneurs, they are employees, they are business owners. Um, we're at all stages of economic of the economic process. And so to shift that thought of, um, yes, we want to be accept, um, accessible rather for consumers, but we also want to have uh, and, and support economic development for disabled business owners, uh, disabled entrepreneurs, small business owners with disabilities as well. So start thinking of disability across the economic spectrum. I also think it's important to highlight two other things, and that is that disability uh, intersects with every other population, right? So people who don't speak English, immigrants and refugees with disabilities, women with disabilities, people of all racial, ethnic, religious um, demographics, the LGBTQ population, right? People with disabilities are present in all of these populations. And so being mindful that when we do include people with disabilities, it's not just certain people with disabilities, but inclusive of all work. Um, and then the other highlight I like to tell people is that everybody, um, everybody listening here, if you do not already have a disability, you will acquire one at some point in your life. So if you live long enough, you will have a disability at some point. Um, and I, I want people to know that this isn't a them issue, right? It's a, it's a you issue, it's an us issue. If you are not already disabled, you will have a disability at some point. And so to start internalizing that the things we do now create a more accessible future for you personally and your families as well. Great point. Very good. Okay. Um, thank you all for that. Uh, I appreciate answering that question. Really good feedback so far. So I'm excited to see what you have to say the rest of the, the time we have. Um, so we've prepared some questions for the panel. And then we'll open to the audience if time allows. So audience, if you do have questions, just simply submit those in the chat and we will bring those up at the end um, to the attention of the panelists. So um, with that, Luis, we're gonna start with you again. Um, how does transportation play an important role in inclusive economic growth? And how is DART addressing this role? So, um, you know, we think that, that Transportation plays a key role in economic growth overall. Of course, you know, uh, in order for, for businesses to grow, they need employees, they need goods. And so all those things need to move efficiently about our region in order <laughs> for that growth to occur. Specifically with transit, we know that the number one, pe the number one reason that people ride DART is to get to work. And so when we think in particular about um, uh, how transit is affordable, accessible, all the things that I listed in my opening, um, being inclusive means that, that we are providing access because, because our service is those things, it's accessible, it's affordable, um, uh, hopefully it's convenient, because it's those things that we can provide opportunities for more people to access um, th those jobs. I think in, in particular at this, at this point in time when our region is growing and has been growing so much, it's really important for us to think about how transportation can grow along with that, both in the, in the footprint, um, in particular of transit. You know, we have we have a transit system today. We have a region that continues to grow. So, how does our transit system evolve to meet those needs of the region? But then also in in the in the how of how we serve people, and actually, I think moves even beyond that transportation to work. As Dawn was saying, um, you know, childcare, uh, access to to training opportunities and schooling. Those are all things that are really key toward economic development. And so when we think about designing a transit system, we wanna make sure that we're not just thinking about that work trip, but we're thinking about the, you know, the way people move about the community to drop their kids off, to you know, take night classes, um, shifts that, that are on the weekends or are outside of what we would normally consider normal business hours. And so we need to have, I think, an expansive you know, vision of, of what kind of a, a commute is. I'll even put that commute in quotes because we, we tend to when we use that word a lot of times we're referring to like how white collar people get to work, but really, you know, the commute includes everything. Um, and, you know, no matter what type of job you have getting to work at home and everywhere in between to your essential services, to taking your kids, to taking your elders where they need to go. 
Um, the other thing about, about being inclusive is that by, by designing with inclusivity in mind, you really are benefiting everyone. And I'll give a couple of examples of that. When we design bus stops that are ADA accessible, that, you know, that can be designed for a wheelchair, that have you know, concrete boarding area, free of obstructions, you know, wide enough for people to get on and off. That also makes it easier for, for seniors, makes it easier for people with strollers, for children, um, all the above. And, and it makes our community look nicer too when we have high quality bus stops. So everybody really benefits there. Or the other thing is that when I think about how to, um, how to describe our services, how do, we, how do we design services so that somebody who doesn't speak English all that well can pick up a, a brochure or a map and understand how to get from A to B? Well, by using you know, um, pictures, by using simple language, um, we actually make it easier for everybody to understand that information. And so I think the more we can think about inclusivity, um, whether it be transportation or in other realms as really benefiting everyone, um, by thinking through those lenses, I think we'll, we'll better our region. Very good. Okay, John, with you serving on the ch uh, governor's child care task force, can you go over some of the recommendations that will benefit the efforts of inclusive economic development? Sure. Uh, first, first, let's remember that the reason why the governor established the child care task force was because her economic um, recovery advisory team made it their number one recommendation. After they had done their research, they recommended to the governor that she needed to address the child care crisis across our state if we really wanted to get the workforce shortage taken care of. So as a result of that, she established her task force. We met for 100 days um, and we came forward with a number of recommendations for her. And just about a month ago, she shared those top recommendations and um, where her priorities are. Um, and I would say to you, quite honestly, all of them are inclusive because they are all different ways to help break down that barrier to child care. So all working parents have an opportunity to return to work or to stay into the workforce and to get the benefits that they need. Um, the most important recommendation that we made was that we find a way to increase the wages of our child care provider and our child care workforce, as well as finding benefits for them. Um, if we can't figure out a way to step out of the box and creatively address that, um, we're not going to have enough child care slots. We already had a crisis. We're going to have an even bigger one if we can't address um, the wages and the benefits for them. After that, we looked at how can we get businesses involved? How can businesses make investments in child care, not only to support their employees, but also to support their bottom lines and their communities? So those are the first two areas that, and probably the two that the Women's Foundation feels are the most important at this point, because we really, as I said earlier, want to see women um, in the workforce because can't be economically self-sufficient if they can't work. Absolutely. Very good. Um, Daniel, even with the Americans with Disabilities Act, much of the economic development can have individuals with a disability unable to participate in the economy, whether it is, a, it is participating in the workforce or being a consumer. What are ways that we can better develop our communities to better serve those individuals in our economy? Yeah, so I, I wanna start this discussion off with I think some statistics about the market share of people with disabilities, because I think it helps to really put this in perspective. And so people with disabilities in the United States and globally make up roughly between 15 and 20% of the population, which is the largest minority group, if we can still say minority at 20% of the world, right? That's a huge population that I mentioned earlier includes all other demographics as well. And so globally, this puts the population of people with disabilities at about 1.85 billion people um, with a market share of $1.9 trillion with a T trillion annually globally. And that's just individuals with disabilities themselves. And so 
1.85 billion people is roughly the population of China plus the European Union. So this is a huge market share globally of almost $2 trillion just for individuals. And when you add in family members, friends, allies, I mean, you're talking about almost three and a half billion people um, and about $13 trillion globally. So proportionally that those numbers still apply to the United States. And so it's important to think of people with disabilities as that market share, right? That if you're not including people with disabilities in your business plan, in your marketing plan, you're missing out on a significant amount of money for, for your business, for your nonprofit, what have you. Um, there was also a, a 2018 study. I want to look at it to make sure that I'm quoting it correctly. Um, a 2018 study from Accenture found that companies which are inclusive of people with disabilities are on average twice as likely to have higher total shareholder return than their peers, 28% higher revenue and 30% higher profit margins than companies that do not include people with disabilities. Um, and so to pull those numbers back to your question about what can we do to harness that, right? To take advantage of that economic possibility of people with disabilities and their families. Uh, I, I would say the easiest step, and maybe this is easier said than done, is that people with disabilities need to be included at all levels, right? So you should have disabled people on your board of directors. You should have disabled people in management roles in all levels of employment. Um, you know, I mentioned competitive integrated employment. employment. Um, that means that a person with a disability should theoretically have access to any position in your organization, um, not just certain ones that we maybe carve out or set aside. I think that by having that focus, right, I kind of mentioned this to Luis before the, the panel we got started, when you hire people with disabilities, right, your, your company, your organization becomes a little bit more accessible and inclusive and it's driven from the inside, right? So instead of just thinking about having an accessible entryway for people to come into your store, when you hire somebody with a disability, you're going to learn all kinds of ways to make an accessible business that's going to drive customers into your business. Um, and it happens in such a more organic, natural way when we're included in that conversation, right? When when disabled people are on your board, are in the are in the HR office, are are working in all of those different positions. So I think a lot of the barriers right now for people with disabilities are attitudinal. Um, if I could, I don't know if that's a word or not, but attitudinal barriers, right? We've we've had the ADA for 31 years now. Um, we at least theoretically know how to make things physically accessible, even if we don't always do it. But there's still this stigma we have to break down. And, and part of that is, is including people with disabilities at all, at all levels, right? Having them involved in a panel like this, having us be represented on, on different commissions and boards really starts to organically make things more accessible. And then you don't have to retrofit, right? It's, it's just accessible and inclusive from the get-go. So I would say that's, that's a way to, to better, um, to make an inclusive economic plan for people with disabilities is include us from the start um, at, at all levels. And it will naturally organically become more inclusive as that goes forward. Sorry, Abby. This yeah. is Dawn. I, I'd, I'd love to jump in here for a minute yeah. if that's okay. So Please. Daniel dazzled all of us with his data. So I don't want to, to, him to be the only one who has some data that he wants to share. <laughs> so um, I'd like to share um, a little bit of data that was presented in February of 2020 from the National Chamber of Commerce Foundation. It talked about the impact the child care crisis was having on Iowa's economy. Mm -hmm. And I think those numbers are a little staggering. And it really shows you um, how child care is impacting the economy. So, for example, over six hundred and seventy five billion dollars, I mean, excuse me, million dollars a year is lost to our economy because of child care. That's almost a billion dollars. 
An additional $157 million is lost in tax revenue because of child care issues. And our businesses are losing an additional $757 million a year because of recruitment and retention and work productivity loss. That's a lot of money um, being lost to our economy every year because of child care. Um, and that's why we know that businesses really need to be a part of it. Um, and we ask the question, why are we seeing those kind of numbers? And we know we're seeing those kind of numbers because, um, you know, 85% of our um, families are making decisions on where they live, where they work because of childcare and the availability of childcare. We know that they're turning down jobs offers because of child care. Um, so it really is impacting um, our economy um, in numbers that I don't think we really imagined that they were. So thank you for letting me share those with everybody yeah. today. And I've got that report. If anybody would like to see it, I'd be happy. It's called Iowa's Untapped Potential. Yeah, no, that was very, I'm glad you did share that because I think it's really important. And I think I'm going to go off script for a moment, Ryan. Um, but I was just, um, you know, as I listen to all of you, I think there's one common denominator is that, you know, think of this sooner, incorporate us sooner. And we have people in the audience that um, may work for the city. They may be business owners. They may be real estate developers. And they're all hearing that. How best do they incorporate um, your missions into their process sooner? Is it reaching out to you directly? Are there local um I guess, representatives that they can be reaching out to, to, to make childcare or transportation or disability act in a part of their expansion or growth. I'll let any one of you speak to how best to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off by just saying, yeah, I think um, working with, and I'll speak for DART, um, from an early stage um, to, you know, especially if you're talking about starting a new business or you're, um, working to, to cite something new in your community that you think from an early stage about transportation. Um, and also to think about where people are coming from. So the housing side of the commute, not just the, the, the work side of it. And, you know, are we having, um, I know there was a, a comment that I see about um, making housing, uh, I think the comment was about affordable, inclusive, um, and those things and having, having a variety of, of housing choices in our communities. So I'll just put a, put a, a plug there and a mention of that, of that comment. But yeah, uh, contacting DART at an, at an early time um, and, and helping us uh, work through your needs. That's good. Yeah, um, and we know at the Women's Foundation that there are businesses that are starting to get it that really understand that childcare is impacting them and their workforce. But what we heard was it's overwhelming and they have so many other things on their plate. Where do they start? What do they do? Um, how can they move some of these investments forward? So we established the Iowa Business and Child Care Coalition, which is a coalition of representatives from 20 of the top largest companies in the state. Um, individuals and businesses that have already made investments in child care or are in the process of making investments in child care, they produced a toolkit um, and this toolkit has six different investments that a business can make in childcare. And these investments, um, it doesn't only just say, here's the idea. It also says, and here are other businesses that have already done this and they're willing to talk with you and they're willing to share with you their experiences. Here are resources to help make that investment possible. And then there's an exercise for them to go through. They can go to the I well, Women's Foundation website IAWF.org, go to um, the business and child care tab and um, ask for the um, toolkit. Here's what I'm even more excited to share with you. As a result of the governor's task force, we are now entering into a partnership with Iowa Economic Development Authority. Okay. And through this partnership, we are going to be hiring an employer engagement director. And this individual will be, is, will be traveling and working one-on-one -on -one with the businesses around our state that want to make an investment in childcare, but need some help, would like some guidance, 
would like some one-on-one -on -one coaching. They're going to be there. They're also going to be that connector um, and hopefully that resource for the tools that they're needed um, for other people who can help them. Um, and we look to be starting that after the first of the year. So we really know that businesses need to be at the table. We know they want to be at the table. We're now creating those tools um, and a way to help them. That is great. It's great because you've, you know, you've done your homework and kind of put that out there that the number one reason is, is access to childcare and, and doing something about it. They'll be a great partner in that. So thank you for that. Dino, did you have any comments in regards to that? If you'd like to. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's a question that we get a lot is people like to kind of echo what Don just said. A lot of companies will come to us and say, we're, we want to hire people with disabilities. We don't know what to do. We're scared of doing something wrong. We don't want to use the wrong words. We don't want to be offensive. They don't know where to start. And so we are a place you can start. Um, I, I always welcome companies to come. I, I sat down with um, some HR professionals from a, a large international corporation that has a base here in Iowa um, just last week. And they just kind of said, we, we don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. We don't want to say something inappropriate in a job posting. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like, okay, this we can handle, right? If you want to hire people, we can get you there. Um, so feel free to reach out to, to us, to me at the Harkin Institute, if that's something that you're interested in having that discussion. We also have a toolkit about this that I um, will plug. So I'm happy to send it um, to Ryan or Abby to distribute it if people want it, but you can also go to harkeninstitute.drake.edu and there is a what do we do tab. If you go to people with disabilities and scroll down a little bit, you will see the Iowa Summit on Disability Employment Business Toolkit. And so that really goes through some of these basics on how you can start recruiting and employing and supporting people with disabilities. So we always want people to refer to that toolkit, share it as widely as possible. But you can also come to us, right? We, we have government agencies, private corporations, large and small businesses come to us all the time and say, you know, we're building a park. How do we make this park universally designed? Or we're building a new work site. What is a way to have our new office be physically accessible? Or we are desperately looking for workers right now, um, might sound familiar to some people. And this is an untapped labor market. How do we recruit and and retain people with disabilities into our employment. So um, we are a resource um, and there are a lot of other disability led organizations in the state and around the country that you could also go to as well. And we're happy to connect, um, connect people with those organizations and be that liaison um, if there's an interest. That's great. It's very accessible, I appreciate that. Um, with that, what time are we? We got some time. So. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Dawn. Can you share successful examples of cities or states that are proactive in achieving an inclusive economy from a childcare standpoint? Are there other communities that are doing the things you'd like to see happen in Iowa? Um, absolutely. Um, know that the Women's Foundation is a very small organization. We're only a staff of two and a half. Um, and so our work is really done by volunteers and community partners. And we started this childcare work back before the pandemic in 2018. We now have 44 communities all across the state with community stakeholders that are, have come to the table that are looking at community led solutions and ways to address the childcare um, crisis within their, in their community. We know the need is so great. It's gonna take multiple solutions in multiple ways, but it's going to be different from community to community depending on their needs. So we're pretty excited and proud of these groups that are doing the work that they're doing. And I've got a map that will show you where they're all at. So if by chance anybody in any of these communities wants to um, get involved at the community level, um, I can connect you to who those people are. Um, I know they would welcome anybody with open arms to come help. As a network, we share tools, we share resources, we share knowledge. 
Um, and we really try hard um, to make sure that what they might want to do in Sioux City, and it's the same thing they're looking at in either Dubuque or Keokuk or Ottumwa, share. Don't recreate the wheel and start all over. Work together. Um, make things happen. And we're really excited because now we're getting calls from other states who want to look at what Iowa is doing and want to see the framework that we've put together and really um, want to make the, the kind of investments that we're doing. And again, we don't want them to have to start all over from the beginning. We're willing to share with them our tools and our knowledge um, so we can address this issue, not only at our local level and our state level, but at the national level as well. Very good. Louise, what about DART? As Des Moines continues to evolve and our region changes, our region expands and contracts in other areas, you know, are there any other um, cities or, or communities that you're seeing that does a nice job of incorporating that evolution of a, of a certain region? Yeah, I think, I think you could go up to the Twin Cities and see, you know, an, an, an area that has, um, you know, approached transit, you know, a little bit more comprehensively. And we have in terms of the, the types of services they provide, you know, more types of services than we have here, the, the frequency and kind of the, the spread of them around their region. Um, I think part of that comes with the state investment in Minnesota. Um, that's a little different than, than here in Iowa in transit. Um, but also I think some of the land use policies that they have there and how that can result in density, which is easier to serve with transit and can be more affordable and inclusive. Okay, very good. Daniel, do you have any comments in that too? Um, any other markets that maybe are a little ahead or? Yeah, I think it's hard to compare cities, especially with, with different population sizes. I yeah. would say two cities in the US that do have maybe proportionally larger populations of people with disabilities. Um, I, I think of sort of the San Francisco Bay area and Washington, D.C. There's a number of disability organizations there. Um, the public transportation system is not without problems, but largely accessible to get into um, subways and buses and things like that, um, whereas some other larger cities don't have accessible um, subway or metro systems. Um, and then I think in both of those cities, you see really interesting examples of um, independent businesses also making moves to be accessible. So in DC, there is a Starbucks that is staffed by deaf people and operates in American Sign Language, um, or at least has bilingual staff. And so being, being inclusive there of just being able to walk in and order a coffee uh, in your native language and having visual menus and things like that. Um, and I think of movie theaters in both of those cities that have showings with open captionings or have accessible seating for events and things like that. So um, not to say that there's not room for improvement in both those areas. And, and certainly there are some cities and businesses in Iowa and in Des Moines that are doing great things too, but those kind of jump out to me as being sort of disabled hubs, I think, and things we can kind of look at. Very good, thank you for that. Um, last question, and you guys can just fire off answers. We have a couple minutes here, and I'd like to allow some time for We've got a couple of questions in the chat. So, um, Daniel, I'll start with you. If you could pass any piece of legislation at the state or federal level to better address this issue, what would that be? Yeah, I think what I would do if I had my, <laughs> my magic policy wand and I could pick one thing is I think at the federal level, I would fully fund the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the federal special education inclusive education law. It has never been fully funded across um, the federal level. And so personally, I, you know, I, I used to work in special education law. And I think a lot of the issues that are holding back people with disabilities start at the education level, right? So fully funding a special education system in Iowa and federally supports our teachers, supports our paraprofessionals, um, provides training and support for occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, behavioral experts, autism specialists, right? Fully funding that and giving our education system what it needs will produce 
inclusive schools where people, you know, students with disabilities learn about career options, learn about, about skills, get employment opportunities. And so, um, I don't know, I, maybe that's optimistic of me to think, but I think if we could fully fund inclusive education and invest in youth with disabilities, then they will, they will lead the economic change that we need in the future. Um, but it starts with supporting our schools and our teachers and, and our students, frankly. That's great, great answer. Uh, Luis? Yeah, I mean, I think it, like many things, comes down to funding. Um, I think, you know, I've tried to make the case for, for public transit's role in economic development and how, you know, we really have inclusivity in our, in our bones. And so, you know, more funding for public transit can really um, provide access to opportunity for, for all members of our community and in particular, those groups who have historically been marginalized. Um, that, that transit can be a, a stepping stone for them to participate in the economic growth of our region. And Don? Yeah, um, I think we saw more child care bills in the legislature last year than we'd seen in the 50 years prior to that. Um, I think we have a real opportunity coming in 22 to see some good public policy come through. Um, and if you take a look at the governor's task force um, recommendations, um, a lot of those are related to um, public policy and what we need. And we are a part of an organization called the Iowa Child Care Coalition. It's 10 advocacy groups that have aligned our message and have taken a look at those recommendations and prioritized them. And quite honestly, first and foremost, we need to invest in the child care workforce with competitive wages and benefits. We can start by doing that by really identifying a sustainable funding source for the wages and teach program that takes us past the state fiscal year of 24. Um, and then once we've done that, we also need to look at ways that we can implement incentives, tax cuts, um, grants, um, credits, different things that we can do to incentivize individuals to go into the child care workforce. Because um, right now they're not going to go in there if they're only going to make an average of nine to twelve dollars an hour and not have benefits. They can go down the street and, you know, work at the McDonald's and the Hardee's and get, you know, 15, 16, 17 dollars. So we really need to look at how we can do that. Very good. Well, we've got about 10 ish, 12 minutes here. Ryan, would you like to, um, should I go into a chat? Oh, there's a Q and A and a chat. Should I do both? Yeah, I think doing both is fine. Okay, it's perfect. Q and A. Public transportation is inclusive and important to these goals, but its impact is limited by having to serve our communities that extensively employ restrictive and exclusionary planning and zoning practices. How do we educate our leaders on the social impacts of restrictive and low density zoning practices, parking minimums, and overbuilt road networks? So that's a big one. Um, you know, this this could be a whole, and I know it has been, you know, whole other talks. Without getting into too much detail, I will say that there are efforts underway um, in our region. Um, one that I participated in is as part of the Capital Crossroads effort. For those who have heard of that, there's an initiative called Here We Grow, which is thinking about um, workforce housing, thinking about uh, the affordability and, and accessibility of, of housing and, and connecting, uh, having, have, having places for, for people to live in, in all our our communities in our region, and, and it does have recommendations around some of these some of these things around around zoning and density and educating policymakers. So there's there's a lot more of the how, but I just maybe just start by directing um, folks to, to to look up Capital Crossroads and the Here We Grow initiative. Here we grow. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, was there another one? I think so. Throughout the history of neighborhood and housing development, discrimination, excuse me, I have to scroll, discrimination has resulted in significant racial disparities in our community. How do we address these specific economic disparities as we move forward with future economic development efforts? 
So I, I can speak to a little bit of this because we've um, we've been giving some thought to this as we as we look at where where we provide services in our region. I think there's there's a couple of things. One is is direct investment it is is acknowledging that there are um, you know historical disparities in how resources have been allocated, and um, in particular as we think about um, you know where if we see our, our regional growth pattern, right? Where are jobs growing, and where can people afford to live? And, and often we see those things being further and further apart. And so we think about how can our transit network serve to fill those gaps? In particular, um, how do we make sure that we have high quality um, transit in, in areas that have been you know, historically marginalized, um, which are tend to be in the core of our region? And how do we connect those to areas with expanding job opportunities, which tend to be um, further out in our region and in other communities? And Lewis, we're doing the exact same thing with childcare, quite honestly. Um, we're looking at the lack of childcare in our low income neighborhoods. And why is there lack of that childcare? What are those barriers? Um, and how can we then address those barriers and make sure that we get more accessible, affordable childcare across our communities and not just in the more affluent middle-class um, neighborhoods? Right. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of times you, you bring up a good point is about empowering these uh, these marginalized communities to tell you what they need and how to serve them. I think too many times we we come with a with a rote you know response of what maybe works for our own personal um, experience, but I think really understanding the, the experiences of others to come up with what those solutions look like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, that's something that, that we've tried to be really inclusive as we think about our public outreach when we're designing, you know, transit services or when we're thinking about impacts to changes to our transit system um, that, we're, that we're making sure that we're being inclusive in, in that decision making. Yeah. And we also found out that we can't just send out a survey and find out what they need and what their things are. You've got to be unique and different and aware and how you get those surveys out because not everybody has access to the same things. And so that's the other thing that we're having to do is be very conscientious and target um, how we're gonna find out what those needs are and how we can best help them. Yeah, and, and leverage um, partnerships and relationships yeah. with, with you know, service providers, community groups, et cetera, who really have those stronger bonds and are able to, to bring voices um, forward. That's why the Women's Foundation is proud of the fact that we're in 44 communities and have community partners in every one of them because we couldn't do the work. They know their communities the best. Very good. All right, with that, we have a few minutes um, for each of you to give a, um, just kind of your closing comments, if you will, to the group. Um, Don, since you're on, if you want to just go ahead and do that here quick. Sure. Um, I, I always like to end each of my discussions with a call for action. Um, and so I will ask everybody on the call today to do three things for us. One, please share with three people what you heard today. The more awareness we can create, the better it will be. So talk about the data that you heard or talk about some of the solutions or ways that you can get involved. Number two is please get involved and help make a difference when it comes to the child care issues, either at your local level or the state level. Give the Women's Foundation a call um, and we'll be there. And number two, um, if you can't use your time, use your financial support. Um, there's a lot of issues out there, a lot of programs out there that really need financial support um, as well as your time to move these solutions forward. So thank you. Very good. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, so I think what I would want people to, you know, I guess I gave you some some takeaways at my, at my mm -hmm. intro, but my yeah. sort of out, outro takeaway is um, to, to recognize that disability affects, disability is a part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're engaging with it or not is a whole other question. But if you do anything that is working with people, you are working with disabled people. And so whatever your, your business, your nonprofit, whatever it is that you do, if you are not engaging with, you know, parents with disabilities, women with disabilities, racial minorities with disabilities, consumers with disabilities, et cetera, you're not doing it 
right, right? You're, you're missing out on a huge market share of your constituents. Um, and, and there's a step you could take today to start making that a little more inclusive, whether it's working on an accessible website or, or making sure that you're physically accessible. There are steps you can take now to start that work. And so that's, I guess, my call to action is whatever it is that you do, whatever sector you work in, if you are not currently actively marketing to hiring and engaging with the disability population across all disabled people, then I would encourage you to sit down with your organizations and figure out how you can start doing that. Because as I mentioned, you are missing out on a huge market share of profitability um, and missing out on making our communities more inclusive as well. Um, something that kind of jumped out to me in the last couple of comments by my co-panelists is that all of our systems work together, right? Uh, affordable housing cannot just exist out um, in a in a bubble, right? The the accessible affordable apartment building has to be connected to a bus line, has to be close to a grocery store with fresh food, has to be connected to childcare, has to be close to a school. All of these systems interact. So um, just start to thinking about about these issues and and how it's all part of the same network and web. Good point. All right, Luis. I would just, you know, ask the attendees to really think about the moment that we're in and how do we leverage um, what could, could seem like a crisis uh, as an opportunity for sustainable and inclusive growth. You know, whether it's responding, you know, to COVID and the way we, we thought about um, people who provide essential services differently or our current um, kind of labor market and how we think about the labor market differently, how we need to, to dig deeper to make sure that we're providing opportunity for folks because, because we just need folks to fill out jobs, um, that, we're, that, we're, that, that we, we implement changes that can be sustainable over time. Also, the growth of our region is another opportunity as we, as we grow in population and jobs that we're making sure that there's, there's opportunity for all and, and we're inclusive in, in how we build out um, in, you know, whether it's, whether it's in housing, whether it's in, in jobs, whether it's in transit, that we're thinking um, holistically and inclusively. Very good. All right, thank you all again. That was very informative. I have several pages of notes. So I really appreciate you doing this today. Um, Ryan, I'll let you kind of wrap us up here with the last couple of minutes and appreciate everybody attending today as well. Thanks, Abby. And thanks again to our, our incredible panel for, for all your work and expertise in these important issues. Uh, to ensure you're receiving all information on the, the partnership policy front, we encourage you to uh, subscribe to our e-newsletter and, of course, uh, listen and subscribe to our monthly uh, policy podcast where we take a deeper dive into some of the issues that we spoke about today. Uh, we will continue our uh, public policy issue forms in 2022. So uh, please pay attention and register once those dates and topics are announced. So thank you all again for your time and everyone have an incredible day.